tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. From author Jeff Sturdevant, I give you Memoir of a Murderer. There is no such joy in taverns as upon the road thereto. Cormac McCarthy, Blood Meridian. Well, as Marie Antoinette once said to the Mater D, let them eat shit. David D. DeGuano, don't mess with Brett. Chapter 1 Welcome to Hell. What do I do for a living, you ask? I'm a writer. I deliver packages 50 or 60 hours a week, but that's more of a hobby than anything. I couldn't blame you for calling me more of a delivery guy than a writer, but it just wouldn't sound right. Could it be I identify as a writer? No, that's not right either. Identity is cheap. Identity is crude. Some people cling to it like a handrail through a hurricane. Me? I tell you I'm a writer with the conviction of a man considering a new brand of deodorant. It's not really that important. And I'm only telling you because you asked. Let's make one thing clear before we begin. I never lie. Everything in this book is true. Names of people, places, and events have not been changed, and the events happened exactly as described. My reputation is that of a truth-teller, and whatever else I've done to malign my good name should have no bearing on this fact. If you found this book under fiction, this is a common categorization error. It happens all the time. But don't be upset with whomever is responsible. People make mistakes every day. People are imperfect. Not me, I mean, but, you know, most people. But take heart, my imperfect friend. By the time you finish this harrowing tale of non-fiction, You'll be a changed person. One cannot experience what I have endured and return to society unchanged. To be dragged in shackles down the dark, dank halls of Orange Oaks Federal Penitentiary, where the cold stony walls drip the fear sweat of a thousand men. Walk with me, past the bathrooms where long, wailing farts give testimony of the substandard fare. Toilet paper so thin, it disintegrates on contact. Past the showers with a phrase, don't drop the soap, is not a trite cliché, but a fervorous prayer, because the floors are terribly schmutzy, and so too will be your soap, if it escapes your grasp. And if your buns look like mine, reader, I keep your back to the wall while you pick it up. Just a formality. Move on, down intestinal alleys of cement and steel, past iron doors with their tiny square holes, like mouths through which the warbling infirmed make an orchestral tuning of human misery, down to the rec room, where daytime TV plays in a crude tube television, where shattered pixels and poor reception make a technicolor meatloaf of Jerry Springer's hair. Put a quarter in the vending machine if the spirit moves you. You shall receive not according to your desires, but according to your deeds. Down the corridor, through the Mexican section where tiny tattooists make mincemeat of Christ's visage. The cell to the left, on one man is being tattooed an Indian warrior. The tattooist has been huffing toilet bowl cleaner and his Indian appears to have Down syndrome. His tattoo gun is made from a tape recorder. Nearby, a vanilla ice casingle lies disemboweled on the floor. A marble-eyed Aztec sifts through its contents like an oracle, prophesizing over chicken entrails. Avoid eye contact, reader. Continue down the corridor, 
past ethnocentric edifices wherein dark figures have dethroned the Jews as God's Israelites. This particular sect has Yidified, and they have taken names like Shlomo, and Pinchas, and Spitzik. Offer no argument, for they speak quickly and with great forcefulness. On the floor huddle the lesser among them, tending to their feet or polishing their idolatrous baubles. Make a right toward the wrought iron gate to the yard, where once a day you'll be allowed your pittance of sunshine. Two guard towers stand like sentinels. On top of the towers, two sentinels stand like sentinels. We call them guards. C.O.s. Lester Pendleton and Randy Beverly, champing at the bit with their fingers teasing the trigger guards. Pendleton is, anyway. Beverly is masturbating. Ground level, the prisoners are grouped according to color. There, by the basketball courts, men with skin as black as onyx. They walk as though they are injured, but they are not injured. They move with a rhythmic truculence, trousers hung precariously on the cusps of their buttocks, they taunt each other in strange esoterica, shaking their heads and baring their gleaming white teeth. By the tables, small brown men with mustaches like malevolent millipedes, speaking in tongues, R's rolling like two cycle engines, the young one on the end there, he drove from Juarez with a semi full of marijuana. Here he tells the story for the thousandth time, how his irritable colon forced him to pull over. Back inside, he'll be expected to perform fellatio for Burrito Grande, the Mexican shot caller. He is the only one among them without a mustache. And by the wall, crouched like tattooed chimpanzees, the white ones watch all others with eyes dark and insensate. Behind the eyes, whirling maelstroms of conspiracy, intricate patchworks of meanness, like a serial killer's collage. Zoom in. Their neurons crawl through the synapses like maggots through rotten meat. See the young one by the chin-up bars, wringing his hands and cracking his knuckles. His nose bent, bent, and rebent, like an old wrench misused as a hammer. In life, he fixed cars and sold meth to high schoolers. In here, he fixes heroin and sells Capri sun pouches of Jenkum. And there, the man watching from the picnic table, the handsome one, with a dashing brown beard and distinguished spectacles, a man with no country, a man with no identity, a man marginalized by society, driven to an act of violence so profound even the birds high overhead alter course to leave me a wide berth. You read that right, my friend. It's me. Oh, are you clutching your pearls yet, reader? Begging to be given back your freedom before you learn how to make a shiv out of a toothbrush? How to cornhole a carton of cigarettes? Survive a race riot? Make a vagina out of a paper towel tube? No one's keeping you here, reader. You're free to leave at any time. I haven't read you your rights, have I? But you're still there. I suppose I owe it to you then to continue. Very well. I'll return to this place if I must. Just one last time. But I won't go alone. This time, I'm bringing you with me. Two. The Incident. Well, that got a little dark, didn't it? Sorry about that. Must have been something I ate. All right. So, let's backtrack just a little bit. In order for you to understand what happened here, we'll need to start at the beginning. Okay. So, I'm a writer whose hobby is delivering packages, yada yada yada. I deliver all sorts of unusual stuff. Frozen animals intended for taxidermy. Canisters of sperm intended for fertility clinics. Even dildos intended for the voracious vaginas of lonely housewives. 
I'm not trying to be crude here. These are near daily occurrences. Voracious Vaginas, incidentally, is a pretty good band name in case you've got a cocktail drum kit you're looking to put to use. I know about the dildos because, well, let's face it, not all packing tape is created equal. Let me take this opportunity to remind you to ship your more illicit materials. Drugs, dildos, severed fingers intended for ransom schemes, etc. with suitable packaging to maintain discretion. My next book will describe this process in painstaking detail. It's tentatively entitled How to Discreetly Ship Your Dildos, and awaiting editing at 740 pages long, so I'll abstain from going any further into it here. In the meantime, my point is this. I can be considered an expert in certain areas. Some of these include picking up boxes, putting them back down, ringing doorbells, and the art and craft of the perfectly packaged parcel. Alliteration is another, but we won't get into that here. Chief among my talents, though, is Mortal Kombat. Now, I know what you're thinking. Does this guy really expect me to believe that he's some kind of street fighter? Well, I'll have you know, my friend, I'm more than just a pretty face. And keeping my face this pretty means having to defend it from time to time. Aside from the occasional gunfight, thwarting of a terrorist plot, or saving some damsel in distress, most of my fights have been against geese. Certainly the most notable one. A goose is a large bird of Canadian heritage. They all look exactly alike. The geese, not Canadians. Most pronounced of their traits is they take a shit every 17 seconds. Goose shit is exactly the same color as grass which results in perfectly camouflaged little landmines for you to step in. Lots of them. At worst, Canadian geese can be considered foreign terrorists. At best, they are prolifically shitting assholes. Sound harsh? Picture someone important to you, your BFF maybe. Now, imagine they took a shit every 17 seconds, all the while rudely honking and nibbling grass. Now ask yourself, do you still have the same esteem for this person? By any standard at all, can this be considered respectable? Of course not. And it isn't just their incontinence that makes geese intolerable. They may all look the same, geese not Canadians, but that only makes it harder to guess which ones are going to assault you while you're going about your business. Yes sir, I've been in my fair share of goose fights. Geese love nesting in business parks, especially business parks I deliver in. During nesting season, the monogamous pairs will return to the same spot as their predecessors. It's sweet, in a way, until you remember that they're foreign terrorists. The female goose will sit on her eggs and the male goose will prowl the perimeter, looking for perceived threats. Once in a while, you'll get a wimpy one. They just kind of wander off and daydream like an ADD kid playing right field. I don't mind those guys. But inevitably you're going to get the bad ones. Those asshole geese who've decided you're the problem. It makes you wonder how they got that way. In all my experience, I'm willing to call it projection. Mistrust all in whom the impulse to punish is powerful, Nietzsche famously said. They are people of a low sort and stock. The hangman and the bloodhound look out of their faces. Mistrust all who talk much of their justice. Verily, their souls lack more than honey. And when they call themselves the good and the just, do not forget that they would be Pharisees if only they had power. The Canada goose in a nutshell, I could not have said it better myself. World's Fair Drive in Franklin Township is the foundry in which my body was forged for battle. One particular season, Building 14, Unit F, the male goose in question was Nietzsche's classic Bronton tyrant. Stupid, too. He walked along the front of the building strategically shitting on every entrance mat. He watched his reflection in the tinted glass doors as he went like a narcissistic bodybuilder peacocking his way through the gym. He was obviously pretty proud of himself. How couldn't he be? 
he was playing his role to a T. I knew he was trouble the minute I saw him. On the fateful day of the Franklin Park showdown, I had a package for Unit F. The narcissistic bodybuilder Goose and I locked eyes the moment I pulled over. I looked at the girl Goose sitting on her nest, but she only seemed to shrug. Yeah, I realize geese don't really have shoulders, but whatever she did, it got the point across. What could she do about it? She made a poor life choice, shacked up with the first swinging dick that crossed her path, and here she was, sitting on her nest while this self-righteous, retarded sociopath showboated around World's Fair Drive, laying coils of green excrement like so many... coils of green excrement. These things happen, she seemed to say, and the asshole goose... He was looking at me like a cartoon chicken leg. I hadn't even gotten out of the truck yet and the situation was already tense. Mind you, anyone familiar with my company knows neither rain, sleet, nor snow will keep us from delivering our parcels. And I wasn't about to back down from some overinflated oven roaster. Besides, I had a secret weapon. This is a good place to mention something about Canada geese that is fairly infuriating. The Canada goose happens to be a protected species under federal law. It is illegal to harm an asshole goose in the United States without permission from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The Canada goose, unquestionably the most common, prolifically shitting, obnoxious bird on the planet in the entire universe, pending the discovery of extraterrestrial birds, is protected from harm by law. Now, if that warms your environmental little heart, consider this. Human beings are not protected from harm by law the same way Canada geese are. If you and I, fellow human, happen to cross paths one day, and I decide for some reason to bend over, open my mouth, and run 20 miles per hour into your private parts, you are perfectly entitled, under federal law, to defend yourself. For that, we should all be grateful. If a Canada goose does this to you, and it happens to be their specialty, just so you know, you are not legally allowed to defend yourself the same way you would against me. Author's note, for the record, I would never do this to you. At least, not maliciously. Add to this the fact that geese are perfectly entitled to shit anywhere they want, and you can see the implicit bias at work. When it comes down to it, there's only one way to describe this iniquity. It's racism. And I won't stand for it. Laws be damned, I have too much integrity to allow this injustice. Ironically, I knew Mr. Big Shot was thinking the same thing. In his bird-brained kind of way. From its perch on the overhead shelf in my trunk, I retrieved my paisley umbrella, released the button on the thingy that held it closed, and brazenly stepped out of the truck. Maybe it wasn't exactly a secret weapon, or even much of a weapon at all, but its bright paisley pattern lent a sort of majesty much more impressive than the goose's plain, undistinguished plumage. He seemed to sense this as I opened the umbrella, seemed demoralized as I slid the umbrella's opening thingy back and forth, urging the bird to shoo and allow me safe passage. Instead, the bird took this as a declaration of war. Like a torpedo, beak agape, the goose rocketed towards my substantial genitals. I parried, closing shut the umbrella and wielding it like a fencing sword. I spun to face the goose. My Aikido approach of using the bird's own momentum against him didn't work as I'd hoped. It turns out birds' wings have their own kind of aileron flaps that allow them to stop and turn very quickly but the adrenaline was flowing, and I was ready. We clashed, beak on the umbrella, umbrella on beak, trading the advantage back and forth like grappling sumo wrestlers. Briefly, I met eyes with the mother goose, seeing something like hope glimmering behind them. She's rooting for me, I thought, and so are my customers. Everyone in the building was up against the window, clapping, shouting, shaking their fists, only for lack of a worthy competitor had this thing become the bane of Building 14. 
and its reign of terror was coming to an end. I was feeling my oats just then, on account of all the attention we were getting, so I decided to run my mouth a little bit. You thought you were done flying south, didn't you? Well, you're only halfway there, buddy, because I am sending you straight to hell. The bird flapped wildly, but I suspect the pun was lost on him. No matter. At this point, I was performing for my audience. Should have stuck to the great white north, cocksucker! The line landed perfectly, but so did my foot land on a particularly plump turd, and I lost my balance. Down I went, my fall mercifully cushioned by countless piles of green crap. The goose was on me. He wound up for a kind of finishing move. Were it not for my quick thinking, his beak would have ended up nostril deep in my chest. Instead, I turned the umbrella sideways and caught the goose's open maw as it came down to eviscerate me. By now, every inhabitant of Building 14 had come out to behold the battle. They emboldened me with their cries of adulation. I planted my foot in the goose's chest and flipped us both over backwards. Now I was on top, my knees pinning his wings to the pavement. He pecked at me, but lacking the leverage to do any damage, his pecker was powerless. I raised the umbrella high overhead and we met eyes one last time. The look on his face said it all. He was a dead duck, and he knew it. I drove the umbrella down with all my strength, the top of the umbrella, the bottom in this instance being that I was holding the top side down, was capped like most umbrellas with a little plastic thingamajig that held all the thingies so they could pivot outward when the umbrella was open. Mine did too, although I'd had it replaced with a razor-sharp plutonium spike for just this purpose. To slay whatever undesirable got in the way of me doing my job. And when the spike pierced the goose's heart, feathers flying, atoms splitting, goose noises rising and waning, I swear I could see the life draining from the little bastard's eyes. And... As its lights extinguished, one final green poop fell lifelessly from his cloaca. The last shit this filthy piece of Canadian poultry would ever take on American soil. I stood, placing one foot on the goose's chest and lifting my fist in victory. A fanfare played in my mind. I earned a hundred experience points and one hundred gold. That's the way I remember it, anyway. You might have read slightly different accounts in the local newspaper. One unobservant witness described it as a slow-motion, wind-resistant slap fight, in which the goose clearly won. Heh. <laughs> Laughable. Well, whoever you decide to believe, one thing is indisputable. It was enough to be thrown in jail, alongside rapists and murderers by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'd been through the fight of my life, and the feathers had only started to fly. 3. Hard Time I thought I'd done a great job defending myself in court, but the judge, living his insulated and bird-free existence, couldn't relate at all to my views on the Canada Goose. Hmm. Frustrating. The real problem started when I attempted to defecate on the courtroom floor to make my point. Contempt of court, he called it. I don't even know what that means, but ignorance of the law excuses not, so they say. And I was sentenced to a week in federal prison for my transgressions. Well, you heard me right. A week behind bars. For defending myself in the face of imminent castration. Oh, it's another good band name. Well, we've got a double kick pedal for the cocktail drum kit. My first day at Orange Oaks Penitentiary was not unlike my first day at the all-black YMCA summer program my mother enlisted me in as a child, being that I seemed the only white man there. A new fish, resplendent in my alabaster skin. 
With my boyish good looks, I feared I'd be raped by hordes of libidinous, prison-svelt savages. Imagine my surprise then when not even my bunkmate seemed interested in raping me. A hulking yet sullen black albino with bright eyes and high cheekbones named Schmilik. Author's note. You ever notice how every character in a book has high cheekbones? I don't even know what a cheekbone is and I couldn't tell you if one was high or low. Still, in case you're one of the readers who enjoys that type of thing, I plan to describe every cheekbone contained herein. Most notable about my Sally, aside from his soaring, angular cheekbones, he was a devout follower of the Nuwabian nation of Moors. Founded in 1967 by Dwight York, the Nuwabian nation quickly rose to prominence as the country's foremost authority on racial studies. As a seasoned Nuwabian himself, Shmulik was chock full of esoteric factoids. White people was created in labs by splicing the DNA of baboons and orangutans. See? Y'all weren't designed to live that long, only to protect the god race. That's why y'all penis is small too, and why your women like to mate with jackals. Hmm, fascinating, I said. This was after a near hour-long dissertation, mind you. I hadn't even introduced myself yet. I'm Jeff, by the way, I said. Schmilik, he said. He offered a fist to bump. Reflexively, I shook it. Had he offered a hand to shake, I'd have presented my fist. I have a deep abiding fear of complicated handshakes. I thought I'd try to change the subject just then, maybe find out what time we had meals, when we were allowed out in the yard, etc. Instead, he taught me about miscegenation, the mixing of races. How such an infamy produced neutronoids with no particular racial affiliation. He harped on the Caucasianoid race, the Mongoloid race, and the inferior hybrid races. He discussed genetically inferior people whose roots lay in extraterrestrial space races. He spoke about the Tamahu, the Caucasianoid race, which included yours truly. But, finally, he talked about the Nibiru, an enormous Nuwabian mothership which would one day collect all its followers and lift them up into space, where they'd live rent-free for a thousand years. I kinda tuned out during most of the race stuff, but that last bit I found incredibly titillating. The Nibiru, you said it was called? That's right. It's hanging out there in the solar system right now. Some call it Planet X. Some call it Nibiru. Whatever you want to call it, it's sure as hell there. And it's sure as hell coming. And when it does, you can bet I'm sure as hell gonna be ready. Blowing this popsicle stand. Know what I'm saying? Are there geese up there? I asked. Geese? Ain't no geese, man. Hell no. Incredible. I said. Did I mean incredible as in non-credible or incredible as in incredible? At the time, I wasn't quite sure. In times of great stress, I found one has the tendency to grasp for ideology as a kind of handhold to the turbulence. One thing I knew for sure, when Nibiru came to Earth, I was sure as hell going to be ready too. I'd be right there at the door with Schmilik. We would both blow this popsicle stand. And when is Nibiru supposed to come again? Nobody knows, man. But it could be any day now. After lunch, they allowed our block into the rec room. A sense of segregation in the air, without exception. The Caucasianoids remained clustered in their designated area. Schmilik sat by himself at what I assumed was the black albino table. I had heard prison was like this, so it shouldn't have surprised me. It just all seemed so petty, considering there was a floating mothership out there waiting to take us all into outer space. Would there be separate tables up there too? I highly doubted it. In space, you could look out the window and see the world in perspective. A flat, circular disk with its sun faithfully revolving it. In space, everything would make sense. 
I waited in line for my turn to use the payphone and left my boss a voicemail that said I was feeling under the weather and would probably be calling out on Monday. I had five sick days left, just enough to serve my sentence and get back to work the following week, unless Nibiru arrived in the interim, of course. In either case, I'd prefer to keep this whole business of being a convicted criminal to myself. The convicts played cards, dominoes, etc. in their exclusive little communities, but I wasn't feeling particularly social. I was weary, beaten. I felt a distant kinship with those poor souls stacking lumber in Siberian labor camps. Political prisoners kneeling on rice in North Korean gulags. Indentured servants in Greenland cutting huge blocks of ice for their Eskimo overlords. It was all too much to bear. I retired to my cell and began writing my memoirs. At the top of my scratch pad, I wrote, Hard Time by Jeff Sturdevant. I sat tapping my little golf pencil for a while, waiting for the wind of creativity to whoosh into my sails. Finally, I wrote, Time. Hard Time. The ticks of the second hand ring through the cold concrete and steel. The winter brings death. The summer brings pestilence. The spring brings longing. Deep, aching longing. <laughs> That's pretty good, I thought. My mind promptly wandered then. First to the New York Times bestseller list, where hard times would undoubtedly take the top slot. There'd be book signings, readings, Q&A sessions, big media appearances. There'd be an audiobook too. Hmm, I need a real big time celebrity voice actor to perform this for me. Hmm, who would it be? A simple glance out of the tiny cell window and I had my answer. At the undulating landfills just beyond the razor wire barriers of the prison. A man whose name is evocative of the mountainous terrain from where he hails. With a blue steel baritone that shook loose the snow caps of the Rocky Mountains. Twelve skiers died in that avalanche. Who better a narrator than Jason Hill? A man with more blood on his hands than even me. We all... It was the dinner bell. I've been writing for four hours, 30 words into my latest bestseller. But they were good words. Four Dashed Hopes Locked back down in our cell to digest the plasticine bologna and baked beans we were fed for dinner, Shmulik resumed educating me on the mongrel races that plague our civilization. I it turns out, am a neutrinoid, part Tamahu, part Jew, the genetic frappe resulting in a kind of abominable stew responsible for most of the world's problems. And here I'd been feeling insecure about my male pattern baldness. Take heart, neutrinoid, Schmilik said. No one is perfect, not here on Earth. My great hope is that when Nibiru brings me up to the mothership, the Ether Nine will restore my pigment and make me whole again. I'm sure they will, I said. Shmulik smiled. Thanks, man. Nuwabu. Just then, there was a little pit-pat sound out in the corridor. We both turned to look. Just beyond the bars was a little paper football. It seemed to be twitching. I looked at Shmulik. It's a kite, he said. It's for you. For me? How do you know? You're the new fish, he said. This is a neutral cell. Since neither the whites, the blacks, or the Mexicans will affiliate with me, they put the new guys in here their first night to get them acclimated. Tomorrow, you'll need to get associated. That note there is an invitation. What if I don't want to be associated? I asked. He chuckled. Just grab the kite, man. Give the line two quick jerks to let them know you got it. I leaned against the cold cell bars. Beyond, what looked like a long string of dental floss ran into the dark down the hall. 
I reached through and picked up the paper football and detached it. I gave the line two quick jerks like Schmilik had told me to, and it withdrew into the darkness like a timid tapeworm. Back on my bunk, I unfolded the note. It read, Greetings, white brother. We haven't met, but an associate tells me you look like a pretty sturdy peckerwood, and we're happy to have you aboard. These are trying times in cell block D. The whites are at war with the blacks. The Mexicans are at war with us both, and we're all at war with the guards. Mostly isolated incidents, but they've been going on so long now things are coming to a head. It's only a matter of time before we have an all-out race war in this block. It's good to know we have one more white soldier among our ranks. After breakfast tomorrow, come by cell 67. Make sure you bring your paperwork. We'll need to make sure you're not a chomo or anything. You know the drill. Lord Peckerwood, Aryan Knighthood. Hey, Shmilik, what's a chomo? Job molester, he said. I'm guessing that's from the Aryan Knighthood. Only three things they don't tolerate. Chomos, Anabs, and Rapists. What's an Anab? Short for Animal Abuser. They got a soft spot for animals. Abuse one, they designate you SOS. Smash on sight. They once drowned a guy in the toilet for killing a brother's pet centipede. Wow, I said. Inside, I was panicking. I glanced at my own papers next to me on the cot. Do you think they'd frown upon something like... Um, attempted murder of a Canada goose? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you'd get more than a frown for that. You didn't do that, did you? Uh, no. No, just a hypothetical question. Good thing, he said. They'd never let you in the Aryan knighthood. I'm not joining any Aryan knighthood, I said. To hell with that, I was too psyched about hanging out with black dudes in space. While I didn't intend to take Lord Peckerwood up on his invitation, my status as an ANAB was suddenly unsettling. While Shmulek snored away in the top bunk, I set to altering my paperwork in case someone happened to come across it. With a dab of whitening toothpaste and a gentle hand, I carefully abraded away where it was typed, Assault of a Goose. That done, I wrote in impeccable courier font, something I thought might be less unsavory, Homicide, with a cheese grater. I adjusted my sentence from one week to twenty-five years. A little more appropriate a societal debt for such an infamy. I lay back on my bunk and admired my work. Eventually, I dozed off. In my dreams, I played a kind of celestial basketball aboard the mothership with the Ether Nine Negros. We wore phosphorescent green, gravity defying uniforms that allowed superhuman maneuvers. Instead of basketball, we played with planets. The one I held now was a perfect replica of Jupiter. Impossible slam dunks into hoops like supermassive black holes. Jump shots that sailed over solar systems. No bleachers full of spectators, but the eyes of countless galaxies near and far. In their witness, we had been made whole. We had been made perfect. Five. New Prospects I woke in the middle of the night with a strange sense of unease and quickly realized I wasn't alone. Shmulek was in bed with me. Behind me. Spooning me. I panicked, rolled out of my bunk and landed on hard concrete. I scooted my back against the opposite wall of the cell, but we were still way too close to one another. This was no longer a cell. It was a crucible. What, man? I thought we were cool. The one-on-one -on -one tension was too uncomfortable. I granted a kind of humanity to the steel toilet bowl and wrapped my arms around it for moral support. It was us against him. Two against one. I wasn't going to do anything, man. Is this the way it is in the mothership, Nibiru? I snapped. If so, I want my own room. Shmilik's attitude went from defensive to dismissive. He chuckled. You think you're getting on to Biru? A Tamahu? Get the hell out of here! 
He turned over and faced the wall. What? I said. What do you mean? Schmilik sighed. You don't get it, man. You're a Tamahu. A mongrel Tamahu, no less. Half baboon, half orangutan, half Jew, half whatever else. You ain't getting on Nibiru with the Ethanon, man. We are going up there to get away from your kind. So we can train for the Great War. And when we come back, we're going to wipe all of you out anyway. So why would we let you on in in the first place? I was stunned. My dreams of interplanetary existence dashed to pieces in an instant. How could I have been so naive? Of course I wouldn't be allowed in the Nuwabian mothership. I wasn't even allowed in their corner of the rec room. I wasn't allowed at their table in the cafeteria. I wasn't one of them. Fine, I said. I don't really like basketball anyway. Sometime later, after Shmulik was soundly snoring, I allowed myself to doze off on the floor. Dreams of Caucasoid genocide, Nuwabian spacecrafts hovering high overhead, shining black jump ships delivering their payloads of dive-bombing goose-shaped projectiles, metallic maws agape, shredding through defenseless white genitals, mine among them. The skies a swirl with fiery goose down, Red Paisley Death. Horizon to horizon, the stars were winking out. In my dreams, I knew why. They were turning their backs. I sat alone at breakfast the next morning. I noticed the Aryan guys eyeballing me from their table across the room. Not maliciously. Curiously, perhaps. Then I remembered I was supposed to visit Lord Peckerwood in cell 67 afterward. I didn't really feel like it, but I guessed it would be rude to not show up. Was I supposed to bring a gift? I stopped by the store after breakfast, which was a small cart attended by an elderly Nuwabian named Avram with asymmetrical cheekbones. I bought a pack of gum to be charged to my commissary account, retrieved my papers from my cell, and made my way to cell 67. Cell 67 was easy to recognize with all the Nazi flags and paraphernalia, there were two muscle-bound men inside, dark eyes, shaved heads, tattoos abound. At the sight of me, though, their expressions warmed. I have this effect on people, I found. Even Nazis. Welcome, brother, said one of the robustly cheeked men. He stood and shook my hand. I had no time to decide how I'd handle the handshake, but it turned out to be fairly standard issue. I'm Lord Peckerwood. This here is my first in command, McClyster. I shook McClyster's hand and introduced myself. Brought you some gum, I said. Well, goddamn, McClyster said, accepting the gift. A sturdy picker would, and a gentleman to boot. I wanted to welcome you personally, Peckerwood said. Our numbers in this block have been dwindling. Even McClyster here is coming up on the last six months of his sentence. At the rate we're going, by next year, we'll be too outnumbered to defend ourselves. We'll get plumb overrun in our own sail block. Thank God you showed up when you did. I had to admit, they certainly knew how to make a guy feel important. McClyster asked for my paperwork and I handed it over. I held my breath while they went over the details. Would they be able to recognize the forgery? Homicide with a cheese grater. Well, goddamn. I'll tell you what, said Lord Peckerwood. That's about the most sadistic, fucked up shit I ever heard in my life. You sound just right. Th thank you, I said. I was voted most sadistic, fucked up student in my high school yearbook. Same here, said Peckerwood. I'll be damned if you weren't custom built for the Aryan knighthood. How much do you know about white supremacy, brother? I told Lord Peckerwood I wasn't particularly versed on the subject. He sat me down on his bunk and commenced to explain what the Aryan knighthood was all about. I tuned out during most of it. Between the devastation of being cast from the mothership and the stress of writing a New York Times bestseller, it was all a lot to absorb. One thing he mentioned stood out, though. A fairly aberrant sentiment that took me completely by surprise. 
whites were inherently superior to other races and should therefore rule over them. After the hulking skinhead had finished his spiel, all I could do was sit there for a moment. Well, brother, what do you say? I stood from the bunk and looked him dead in the eye. There was a pregnant pause while I calculated my response. That... Sounds terrific, I said. Count me in. How refreshing to hear I was inherently superior to all other races, for precisely the same reason I wouldn't be allowed of the Nuwabian mothership. Well, to heck with the mothership. It was probably gay anyway. They wasted no time inaugurating me into my new role. In minutes, I was acquainted with Ronnie, the knighthood's resident tattoo artist, for my swastika tattoo. Typically, prison tattooists aren't known for doing the most refined work, but I'm proud to report this is no more than a sweeping generalization of a group of people, something I personally do not tolerate. And Ronnie's work was second to none. Examining the saucer-sized swastika on the left side of my chest, something made me feel uneasy. It took me a minute to mull it over, but eventually I figured out what it was. Ronnie? I asked. Yeah, brother. I'm a bit of an aestheticist at heart. Symmetry, geometry, you get the idea. Could I trouble you for another swastika right here? I indicated the right side of my chest, completely bare of Nazi imagery. Well, sure, brother. I like a guy who jumps in with both feet. We kind of got on a roll from there. By the time he was finished, I had matching swastikas on both sides of my chest. These sharp-looking lightning bolty thingies on my shoulders, and white pride across my stomach in Herculaneum font. We celebrated with Kool-Aid and other fancy comestibles bought with the knighthood's sprawling commissary account. It felt good to be accepted for once. More than just accepted. Embraced. As the celebration came to a close, it was time to talk business. I'd been accepted into the organization, but my initiation was not yet complete. We've got an item of business to attend to, brother, Lord Peckerwood said, and I've got a feeling you're just the man for the job. I assured him that I was, hoping it'd be something I was used to doing, like delivering packages, or picking up packages, something along those lines. He leaned in close. A guard tipped us off. We've got an ANAB on our block. Came in yesterday. What more like ourselves. But he sure as hell ain't one of us. Motherfucker broke into the zoo and raped a pelican. He... He what? You heard me right, brother. Sick some bitch cornhole a poor innocent pelican. Or... Maybe it was in the egg hole. I don't really know the specifics. Not that it matters. The important thing here is we got a Major League ANAB, and I have designated him Smash on site. And the guy who's gonna smash him is you. Chapter 6 Brass Tax Lord Peckerwood had me move to a cell in the white section of the block. My new cellmate was a mildly retarded white supremacist named Gilbert, whose cheekbones were fairly nondescript. He spent most of his time folding a dollar bill in peculiar ways to decode secret messages from the Illuminati. He was a decent cook, though. He welcomed me to my new home with a nice candy bar parmesan. And he didn't try to rape me last night, so I woke well rested. Recipe. Candy bar parmesan. Serves two. Warm candy bar in armpits until chocolate is tacky. Roll candy bars and breadcrumbs from stale sandwich bread until suitably coated. Slather ketchup from two ketchup packets on breaded candy bars. Cover each with a slice of American cheese. Warm on heater until melted. Serve and enjoy. He was also kind enough to make me my very own prison pussy. No one had ever made me one of those before and I found it a kind of touching gesture. I thanked him and told him I make love to it at my earliest convenience. Recipe. Prison Pussy. Serves one. Fill one Ziploc sandwich bag with marmalade. 
stuff bag into empty paper towel roll. Decorate outside with tasteful designs, being flowers, butterflies, etc., or use a stencil to inscribe it with a tender sentiment. In this case, he had written, Best Pals. Today was an important day. I'd be working out the details to smash the pelican rapist, thus solidifying my membership in the Aryan knighthood and ensuring my continued supremacy. The problem was, and perhaps you've guessed this much by now, I've been a little misleading about certain details in this story. Misleading might be too strong a word, actually, especially for a guy who's as honest as me. I'll admit to futzing with rhetoric at times, maybe being a little hyperbolic. Yeah, I'll go with hyperbolic. Hyperbole, another area of expertise. In any case, I'll have to adjust the tracking on a few minor elements. The title, for starters, murderer, may not have been the most accurate word there. It was a goose, not a human, and I hadn't exactly killed it. Full disclosure, I'm not even sure I actually hit it. It was a pretty flimsy umbrella, and it may have broken from swinging it too hard. And that comment about being adept at Mortal Kombat. Well, I'm not even that good at the video game. So, this guy I'm supposed to... smash? Well, duck soup for your average battle-hardened Aryan warrior is probably way tougher than I am, and I doubt I could hurt him at all, let alone smash him. After all, he's obviously strong enough to hold down a pelican. The man's name is Kevin Morton. He's around my height, but has at least 40 pounds on me. With his wispy hair and ruddy complexion, he's something like a bespectacled tomato. No cheekbones whatsoever. He looks precisely like the type of guy you'd expect to make love to a pelican without express consent. If it became his design, however, he could probably do the same to me. The plan of attack is ultimately my prerogative, but McClyster thinks my best bet is to attack him out in the yard while some of the others distract the guard. The guard posted on yard duty tomorrow is C.O. Beverly, the same crooked cop who blew Morton's cover in the first place. He'll be happy to look the other way. The idea is this. With a sufficient smashing, the prison will have no choice but to move the pelican rapist out of our block, creating a vacancy for a more suitable white brother. The stakes are high. If I'm caught somehow, I'll most certainly have time tacked onto my sentence, and I only have enough sick days to get me through this one week. Worse still, if I mess this thing up, I'll end up bringing heat on the Aryan knighthood. The whole D-block could end up in lockdown. I might end up getting smashed over it myself. At the very least, I'll have my white supremacy revoked and end up prostrated at the door to Nibiru, never to be let aboard. A man with no country. A man with no identity. How very sad. Brass tacks. I had to find a way to pull this off and in spectacular fashion. After breakfast, I went to the rec room to think about it. Quickly, though, my mind wandered to my best seller in the making. Only about 30 words so far, but the thing had potential. I hadn't worked on it since that first session, but it was probably a good idea to let it breathe anyway. Hard time. In the meantime, I thought I'd get prepared for the big release. The audiobook was a crucial matter. I'd need to contact my chosen narrator and lock down this deal. I couldn't have him bogged down with lesser books once Hard Time was ready for publication. I waited my turn for the phone and dialed information. Once I had Jason Hill's number, I wrote it on the wall next to the payphone with my little golf pencil. I called Collect, recorded my name as the one and only Jeff. Speak. Hey, oh, there's that voice. Thanks for taking the call. This is Jeff Sturdevant. Who? Do we know each other? Jeff Sturdevant, the author. Hey, you'll never guess where I am right now. Wait, hold on. Who the fuck is Jeff Sturdevant? What? Oh. Oh, right. The flurf guy? Yeah, see? Anyway, I wanted to ask you a Listen, bro, I've got like five girls lying here. Can we maybe... You'll never believe where I am right now. The big house man. Doing hard time. You're in jail? What did you do? Uh, it's not important. What's important is I've got a big bestseller in the works. Think of it as Orange is the New Black meets Hellraiser meets Terminator 
meets Bloodsport meets Time Cop. <laughs> it's going to be pretty wild, man. And guess who's going to narrate the audiobook? You are, my friend! The Rocky Mountain Madman! Um, my schedule's pretty full up, bro. Listen, I've got company right now. Can we maybe... It's settled then, I said. I'll have my people contact your people. Whatever, bro. I'm gonna go now. All right. Uh, uh, oh, good, good. Be well, Mr. Hill. And congratulations. I hung up. It was good to get that detail ironed out. Two o'clock was yard for the D-block. C.O. Pendleton was up at the tower, loading, unloading, reloading his rifle. Wednesdays, everyone was perfectly behaved. Thursdays, C.O. Beverly stood watch. The yard was a free-for-all. The idea came to me while we were doing push-ups by the chin-up bars. Looking to my right, I saw Morton in his usual place, alone, bouncing a tennis ball against the wall near the bathrooms. He never left the area, never went into the bathroom, always in full view of the guard tower. I think he had a pretty good idea there was a target on his back. I'm going to talk to him, I told McClyster. What? Why would you want to do that? I'm going to get his trust, I said. That way, when he sees me coming tomorrow, he won't think anything of it. McClyster appeared to roll that around in his head for a minute. We met eyes. Psychological warfare. I like it, brother. Do what you gotta do. I'll make sure the others know it's above board. I nodded and the two of us got to our feet. I made my way toward the bathroom, keeping a perfectly amiable look on my face. Something odd came over him when he saw me approach. I was worried he might hit me before I even said anything. Hey there, I said. I'm Jeff. Thought you might need some company. Are you one of those Nazis? I don't want to talk to any Nazis. Eh, not really. I'm actually Jewish. I was Nuwabian for a day. Can you believe it? If you're not a Nazi, then why do you have two swastikas in your chest, SS bolts on both your shoulders, and white pride written across your stomach in Herculaneum font? Oh! oh you mean these? I brushed my shoulder as if to swap the pesky bolts away. Then I shrugged. I can be impulsive at times. Sometimes you just want to fit in, you know? He sighed, looked down briefly. Yeah, well, I guess we all make poor decisions at one time or another. I nodded. You're talking about the pelican, I gather? Morton's eyes turned cold. How do you know about that? Hey, settle down. I don't want to panic you, but people do know about it. That's why I'm here right now. I think the guy could sense well enough that I wasn't about to stab him. I'm just not a stabby-looking guy. If anything, I radiate a kind of saintly beatitude that penetrates deeper than steel. Just in case, though, I positioned my eyebrows at such an angle that bathed him in empathy. It's a talent of mine. Very disarming. What am I supposed to do? He asked. I made a mistake. I wish I didn't. I... I couldn't help it. I... I... Take it easy, I said. I put my hand on Morton's shoulder, leaned in close. I'm not judging you one bit. We all have issues with birds every now and then. I couldn't care less. But those men, back there, the ones with the practical haircuts, they care an awful lot about it. And they expect something out of us. Both of us. So, that's our job right now. We have to figure out how. We're going to give it to them. 7. Smash Day The day had arrived. It was an ambitious plan I'd come up with, but certainly more feasible than a conventional smashing. After our little chat in the yard, I'd learned the following about Kevin Morton. He had indeed made love to a number of pelicans, and regretted each one more than the last. His frequent bouts of ornophilia had begun as a mysterious symptom of CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. He couldn't prove it in court, but he'd seen all manner of behavioral changes in his peers, all who happened to bump their heads and rattle their brains much more than your average Joe. Kevin, 
was an ex-pro wrestler. It all started after being badly concussed during a ladder match. He lost interest in the sleazy ring rats who traveled around with his group. His first bird was a frozen chicken. His next was a roadkill buzzard. From there, things escalated. He took greater and greater risks. He traveled to faraway lands to fuck exotic poultry. He was nearly disemboweled in Australia while attempting to mount a cassuary. He lost three toes to frostbite, raping penguins in the Arctic. He acquired E. coli, performing oral sex on a deceased pigeon. He was a man excommunicated from polite society. A man who'd lost his identity. How very sad. But out of that sad story was an opportunity for redemption. Our cells were only three apart, so we were able to shoot our kites back and forth after the lights went off last night. Gilbert was awake the whole time, but so engrossed in folding his dollar bill, he had no idea of the conspiracy taking place. Every five minutes or so, he'd squeal in victory, sure he'd uncovered some new secret of the Illuminati. Then, he'd sigh and begin again. All the while, Kevin Morton and I were making plans, sharing suggestions, taking notes. By midnight, I was laying back on my bunk studying the sheet I compiled in the light of Gilbert's cigarette lighter, committing it to memory, visualizing it from start to finish. I knew Kevin was in his cell doing the same. D-Block was on yard and the Aryans were doing leg lifts by the chin-up bars. Morton was bouncing his ball out by the bathrooms and C.O. Beverly was masturbating up in the guard tower. With a glance back and forth, I confirmed to Lord Peckerwood that it was time time to smash this pelican rapist, this libertine of the lowest order. I got to my feet and started toward the bathrooms. I could feel the eyes of the Aryans on my back. I could sense their excitement. They wanted blood, and I was going to give it to them. Well, kind of. Hey, Birdman! I shouted. Morton turned to face me. I rushed him, swung a wild clothesline. He ducked. I turned disoriented. He ran to the cement wall of the blockhouse, bounced back with increased momentum, countered with a clothesline of his own. It landed, knocking me onto my back. I could hear a collective groan from the area in knighthood across the yard. No matter. This was merely the inciting incident of our three-act play. In the end, the protagonist would get his man. Morton picked me up by my hair, which was tricky since I had no hair, and hit me with a flurry of feather-soft punches which I sold mightily. He kicked me in the stomach, and I leapt into the air to exaggerate the impact. He axe-handled me to the ground, rebounded off the cement wall, returned again with a Hulk Hogan leg drop. The impact, while non-existent, generated an ooh from an audience I hadn't realized it formed. Through my half-lidded eyes, I saw something unusual. The Mexicans, the Blacks, the Whites. They had all gathered around to watch. I saw the anger and frustration in the Aryans' faces, the wide smiles of the blacks, uncharacteristically amused for this time of day. The Mexicans were bouncing around like jumping beans. I suspect they were nostalgic for the Lucha Libre competitions of their native Mexico, but they were all there, standing shoulder to shoulder. While Morton was peacocking around, showboating as only a pro wrestler can, I was slowly getting back to my feet. The blacks shouted ceaselessly for Morton to, Turn around, man! Look out, man! He's getting up, man! But, of course, he would do nothing of the sort. In the end, the villain is undone by his fatal flaw. It was time to get smashed. Kind of. With a hand on Morton's shoulder, I spun him around. I swung a great fist, which sailed at least a foot in front of his face, but sent him spinning with the perceived impact. The Aryans erupted in cheers. I bounced off the elastic blockhouse and returned with an elbow drop, which hurt me a lot more than it did Kevin. Still, he writhed on the ground like I dropped a piano on his chest. I stood to face the audience and pulled my shirt off, tossed it into the crowd. Gilbert caught it in both hands and clutched it to his chest. I struck a most muscular pose, which sent my swastikas a ripple and delighted the audience. Even C.O. Beverly seemed wrapped from the guard tower, but I could tell by his bobbing cheekbones that he was still masturbating. It was time for my finishing move. 
I picked Morton up by his hair and drove my knee into his guts. He doubled over obediently and I stuck his head between my knees. It occurred to me strongly just then that a power bomb was an ambitious maneuver for me, a bird-bodied 40-year-old Jew, to have chosen, especially considering the fact that I had never executed one before. Neither had I any coordination, athletic ability, or even a semblance of the strength necessary to lift a man of my own weight, let alone one 40 pounds heavier. But it was too late. We were already in Act 3. With a pants-shitting grunt and the squeal of a trillion muscle fibers never before activated, I had Morton up in the air. His own effort was essential to this, keep in mind, much more than my own. I think we both surprised ourselves just then. I, because I wasn't accustomed to lifting giant bird fuckers into the air, and he, because, by golly, he still had it in him. We met eyes at the apex of the power bomb, and in that brief moment, I could see the renewed spark behind them. Even after the injuries, after the CTE, after this wave of ornophilia had crashed over him, left everything he'd worked so hard to build scattered, broken, and buried across the barren beach of his existence, even now, he still had it in him. Gravity reclaimed Kevin Morton, and his 200 plus pounds of bulk crashed into the earth. The theatrical blood pack he'd made from Kool-Aid popped, and a pool of grape-flavored gore blossomed beneath him. The crowd went wild. I raised my fist in victory. A fanfare played. I received 100 experience points and 100 gold. 8. Rising Star If a smash there ever was, it was done this day. Since no one wanted a pelican rapist around anyway, the administration kinda swept it under the rug. Morton would be moved to the loony wing, reserved for the medication-dependent, drug-addicted, and pathologically strange. In the loony wing, there were inmates with all kinds of unsavory inclinations. Morton would blend in with the wallpaper. He'd be safe there. More importantly, he'd have reclaimed his identity. He was no longer Kevin Morton, the D-block bird fucker. He was Kevin Morton, the professional wrestler, who would occasionally become amorous with a bird. But I ask you, dear reader, good friend, pal of mine, apple of mine eye, who among us is without sin? Who among us has never done anything at all unusual with his wiener? Yeah, me neither. My own status had received an upgrade. McClyster, floored by my theatrical smashing, had stepped aside and given me the key, so they say. A second in command for the Aryan knighthood, I'd worked directly under Lord Peckerwood, managing the distribution of methamphetamine, marijuana, cocaine, and jenkum, a fermented excrement product delivered in Capri sun pouches using the sharp end of the straw as a needle. Gilbert synthesized these, it turned out. Who knew the guy was a chemist? Verily, I tell thee, you cannot, ever, judge a book by its cover. Except for maybe this one, whose cover and contents are equally exceptional. It's customary after a smashing for the Aryan involved to receive a commemorative swastika tattoo. But I really didn't want another one. This is a good place to mention something about me that you might not know. I loathe to be offensive. It's my great commission in life to spread happiness, mirth, and good feelings wherever I go. Kind of like a Johnny Appleseed of positive vibes and jolly cooperation. That said, I could never risk offending Ronnie by turning him down. So, he tattooed yet another swastika on my left butt cheek. Examining it in the mirror afterwards, it predictably threw off my sense of feng shui. Could you do the other cheek too? I asked. As usual, we got on a roll. After the second swastika was done, I let him attempt a freehand portrait of Adolf Hitler on my back. The plan was Hitler, in repose, thoughtfully stroking a kitten. I could tell by his disappointed grunts that it wasn't going well. Ultimately, I let him cover up the whole mess with a giant black swastika that ran the length and width of my back. Quite a few big cartridges bit the dust that afternoon. 
Now in the upper echelon of the elite white supremacist organization, the weight on my shoulders rivaled the soreness of my back and buttocks. I wondered if I could bring some meaningful change to the group, maybe help them be more likable to the general public. Was it too lofty a goal to teach them the folly of generalization? Maybe once I was running the place, I am Jewish, so I knew it was only a matter of time, I could teach them that stereotypes were offensive, and a little moderation might make white supremacy that much more palatable. Pipe dreams, of course. Even my illustrious promotion was bittersweet. Fact is, I'd only be holding this position until Saturday at noon. I felt bad that I'd lied to my new friends. They were under the impression I'd just started a 25-year bid. Since I never lie, my new position of power came with a measure of dissonance. But what choice did I have? If I hadn't forged my paperwork, I'd have been smashed myself, made to serve my own sentence in the loony wing, among deviants and degenerates. Oh, I'd certainly have been raped in there. You have to understand, I'm seriously good-looking, bordering gorgeous. Tight, perky-ass cheeks, velveteen skin. And have you seen my lips? I'm practically built for sucking cock. And believe me, I am not a guy who goes down easy. Back in my cell, I worked on my manuscript by the moonlight in my little window. I wrote, I yearn to feel the grass beneath my feet. To feel the... Hmm. I tapped my pencil for a while. What did I yearn to feel? Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. An hour or two later, I realized I didn't really yearn to feel anything. Something was fundamentally wrong with what I was doing here. Honest writing is a common refrain among writers that few of us genuinely understand. It occurred to me in a moment of clarity that the 42 words I'd so far compiled were not written honestly. While they might have been destined for bestseller status, I had far too much integrity to continue writing this way. This book would be honest, I decided, no matter the outcome. Not only the content, but its entire execution. No manipulative language to play on the reader's emotions to attempt to make the reader laugh or cry. No attempted imagery to create pictures in the reader's minds. No metaphors, similes, or any attempt at all to appear clever. I bring with me only the tools I have at my disposal. No research to establish authority. No thesaurus to come up with ostentatious, extravagant, showy, baroque, or rococo adjectives to add color to my prose. I write nothing but the truth. The truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. No cliched phrases, either. Maybe this was the real reason I'd come here. A sentence handed down not by the state, but by providence. God knew, with all the picking up packages, putting down packages, etc., there was just too much chaos out there to hear the whispers of wisdom all around us. The things that, once you realize them, seem so obvious. Yes, this was the real reason I'd been sentenced to prison. To glean this cosmic wisdom, not unlike Gilbert with his folded dollar bill, but with much greater implications. I had become a conduit of divine inspiration, a lens through which you all might have a chance to see things clearly again. Not a window from the observatory of the Nuwabian mothership, but two little self-centered windows on the front of an uncommon man. All you who accuse from your floor-to-ceiling penthouse windows that I can't see the forest for the trees, I say to you, you can't see the trees for the forest. I say, I myself am a tree. You are a tree. I grow alone. Not with other trees, but despite them. Not all of us bear fruit. Mine happens to be delicious, but it's no obligation of yours to enjoy it. Neither is it mine to enjoy yours. Most of your fruit is bland and mealy. Some is fundamentally disgusting. Some, positively poisonous. I refuse to write your way. I refuse to write for you. Oh, I don't mean you, my friend. You're not like everyone else. Clearly, you understand that it's not a book you hold, but a rock. These are not words you read, but the composition of some eternal stone, 
undying, unending, incorruptible. Intrinsically, you understand that this very work you hold in your hands, or in your ears by way of the inimitable you-know-who, mm-hmm, wink-wink, is the most important literary work since the inception of written language. So far, I mean, these eight chapters were written this very night in a single, furious session from my cell in Orange Oaks. I'll have to stop now because I don't know what happens next. My golf pencil is worn to a nub. Gilbert is asleep with his dollar bill on his chest. Before I retire myself, I'll throw my previous manuscript in the toilet and ceremoniously piss on it. Because it, and all other words, my friend, are writ in water. 9. Race War Well... That last part got kind of intense, huh? Sorry about that. Must have been something I ate. In any case, the introspective mist of the late night hours had cleared somewhat by the next morning's call to breakfast. Another day, another dollar, as they say. I was now in the twilight of my prison sentence. Six days breaking rocks in the big house, and here I was. A battle-hardened, prison-tatted convict. You could tell by that distant, empty look in my eyes that I was not one to be trifled with. A man who'd been to hell and back. A man who'd watched Jerry Springer on a 14-inch television. Even my daily call-outs to work had lost that humble, apologetic tone. They had become brazen. Uncaring. My God, I thought to myself. I'm losing my humanity. Much longer behind bars and they wouldn't be able to let me back out. I was becoming feral, a man undomesticated, an animal. I was on my last sick day. Hm. Good thing I was out of here tomorrow. There we were in the cafeteria. The D-blocks segregated their respective tables. The blacks, the whites, the Mexicans, the lone albino. But something was different this morning. A kind of conspiratorial electricity among the prisoners. It wasn't lost on Lord Peckerwood either. His eyes darting around at nothing in particular. The Mexicans were much quieter than usual, too. Only the occasional rolling R from their end of the room. Something's up, brother, said McClyster. I nodded. What do you think is going on? It's going down soon, said Peckerwood. Remember that kite I sent you? There's been a cold war brewing between the camps for months. Years, maybe. It's like a volcano around here. When a whole bunch of people hate each other for no reason like we do, the tension just builds up. Eventually, it's gonna pop. He was right. The tension was so thick you could cut it with a shiv. Thick as meatloaf. You could cut slices of it and garnish each with a parsley sprig. Hmm. In line with our trays, it was plain to see that the black kitchen workers were doling out half portions of oatmeal to the whites and Mexicans, shoveling out full scoops for their melanized counterparts. And when it came time to sprinkle the raisins on top, the blacks would receive the choicest, most plump specimens, while the others were dry and desiccated. My own allotment was a single raisin, a runt to begin with. It was now no longer than the period at the end of this sentence. Not a raisin in the sun, but a raisin left in the sun to die. Pinchas, the Nuwabian raisin doler, placed this gingerly, almost symbolically, atop my dollop of oatmeal as if to suggest this was the crown jewel of my breakfast. This was all I amounted to. This was all I was worth. We returned to our table, glaring dolefully at our discriminatory portions while the blacks luxuriated in their lavish portions and rotund raisins. They weren't even hiding it anymore. They were practically trumpeting their disdain for us, not even pretending to be polite, during the most important meal of the day, no less. Breakfast. The one time when race didn't matter. You'd sooner find an atheist in a foxhole than a racist at breakfast. At least I thought this was the case. Not anymore. Peckerwood was right. We were reaching critical mass. The first raisin flew minutes later. 
A plump black raisin bounced off McClyster's shoulder and landed on the table. We all saw it happen. Every eye at the table was on that raisin. Perhaps the most consequential raisin to ever be lobbed. Not a raisin per se, but a declaration of war. Follow me, reader, backwards through time as this raisin returns to its box and is loaded back on the truck. Backwards, as the truck drives in reverse down the interstate, docks at the raisin factory or wherever it came from, watch the little fruit rehydrate, become a grape once again, see it return to its original bunch, along with its brothers and sisters, see the bunches withdrawal into the vine, and the vine withdrawal into the earth, who planted this abomination? Better yet, who raised this monster? This monster, who was responsible for what was to follow. McClyster returned fire, but his raisin was so dry and hard it was enough to draw blood. It struck Ishmael, a high-ranking Nuwabian, in the nape of the neck, the effect not unlike a tiny shuriken. He squealed, stood, and faced the white table with his hand cradling his neck. What the fuck, man? That was all it took. Deep in some Nuwabian control center, two Ether-9 Negros turned their launch keys in unison. Raisins entered the atmosphere, each on a predetermined course of destruction. The Whites came in low, whipping rock-hard raisins like line drives. Mexican artillery entered the fray. Small battalions of Whites and Blacks broke off to return fire. Succulent Black raisins achieved re-entry found their unwitting white targets by surprise. Men of the front line fell. Already we were running out of ammo. This was madness. This all needed to stop. Someone needed to do something. The most amazing thing happened to me just then. Out of this madness, this nuclear breakdown of human decency from which I thought we might never return, a kind of revelation came over me. Whether by chance the horror of war, or perhaps something greater, I did not know. But a great wind of insight filled my sails, and my grasp on reality extended to the ends of the earth, like I instantly had a handle on all the world's problems. I knew this episode would be fleeting. Great winds of insight always are. If I hoped to save the universe, I'd have to act fast. Stop! I said. I was standing on top of the table now. I didn't even remember climbing up there. Every eye in the cafeteria was on me, many of their arms still cocked and at the ready. Can you not see past your own noses? A pause. Many of the prisoners took this literally. All around the room, eyes crossed as they put it to the test. That's not what I mean, I said. The first thing I learned when I came to prison was that I am white. The Whites sit over there. Sound familiar? The Whites sat somnambulant. The Blacks looked suspicious. And the second thing I learned was that you, I gestured at the Blacks, are Black, and the Blacks sit over there. A few of the Blacks scratched their heads. In the end, they nodded them. We get it, man, said a Black named Gefeltafish. They pit us against each other, so we're too busy to fight against them. It's Prison 101, man! And you want us to be unified. Malachi, the black shot caller, piped in. We get it. Like every trite, good-natured cracker wants us to be. All together, living in harmony. That right? No! I declared with uncommon authority. I come with a greater commandment. Eyebrows raised from wall to wall. Yeah, I had not come to unify the world. I had come to divide them. Not from each other, but from themselves. A procedure to be performed without anesthesia. I'm asking you all to abandon your tribes, I said. To abandon all tribes. We're born, each one of us, with this gaping hole in our heart so that we may struggle to find our true purpose. The lost among us confused purpose with identity. Filled our hearts with the tenants of their tribes to use group identity as a handrail to the human experience is to miss the whole point of being human. In our tribes, our true purpose can be no greater than our common denominator. So we shackle ourselves to the rail, 
We make victims of ourselves and declare moral authority. We make virtuous our pride, our envy, and even, even our self-righteousness. And to what end? The human spirit cannot be sustained in the ecosphere of any group, because our hunger is what keeps us moving forward. It's the same hunger which declares our right to freedom is God-given. The path of the human spirit is one of gratitude and gratification. But it takes courage, my friends. It takes bravery to stand on your own while the mob surround you with their shackles and their red-hot branding irons. But imagine the freedom. No need to hate what you don't hate. No need to like what you don't like. No need to stand for anything. No need to kneel for anything. No ideology to find affronted, no stake in matters irrelevant. I'm asking each of you to erect a statue of yourself in the temples of your soul, to shed your tribal garments and lay bare the gaping hole in your heart. Empty it of all the baseless rage and mindless groupthink, the convoluted belief systems. Abandon your group, declare your identity as your own, put your spirit in charge, and let your spirit alone decide how to fill your precious hole. Until then, take care of yourselves and each other. The wind in my sails was quickly dwindling now. I was pretty sure I'd stolen that last part from Jerry Springer. I wondered if I'd made my point. I wondered if I made a point at all. Seconds later, I had trouble remembering what point I'd been trying to make in the first place. Like I explained, these inspired moments of mine are always short-lived. They have to be, I guess. Any longer, and you start to sound preachy. Whatever I'd said, though, I'd forgotten everything by now. Something had clearly changed in the room. Everyone was so still. I had to glance at the clock to make sure the second hand was still moving. It was like they all had become trees. But what I saw wasn't a forest. Just individual trees. Lord Peckerwood was the first to move. He stood and stepped away from the white table. He faced the room. He said... I am Lord Peck... <sighs> I mean, Derek. My name is Derek, and I... I... I want my hole filled. The next to stand was Malachi. The Aryans regarded him suspiciously at first, but the man's body language was unprecedented. No rhythmic truculence. He stopped before Lord Peckerwood, or Derek, and said, I'm Alan. That's my real name. And I want my hole filled, too. It was a sentimental moment in the cafeteria of Orange Oaks Federal Penitentiary. A tender heart beat in every chest. But only once, or twice, I imagine. Because Malachi's enormous black erection quickly became the center of attention. And Lord Peckerwood's knees hit the linoleum. First one, then the other. And in an amalgamation of abomination, racial harmony in the D-block was finally achieved. It was truly going down now. Some convert angel of perversion poured out her bowl of debauchery on orange oaks. McClyster and a fat Nuwabian named Schmeckel met belly to belly in a splash of adipose tissue and writhing tongues. Gefeltefish, tripping to get out of his pants, fell into the lap of a Mexican drug dealer. Spitzik had his tongue in some white guy's belly button. Pinchas had a Mexican hanging from each nipple. Prisoners flooded into the middle of the room. Aryans and Mexicans mixed it up like arrows y frijoles. Pale horsemen mounted white stallions. The same stallions impaled black mares. A species of human centipede formed throughout the cafeteria, which an entomologist could only call Chylopoda analingus. Gilbert sat masturbating in the corner, alternating glances between the interracial debauch and his tattered dollar bill. Ronnie the Tattooist put an end to this by swatting the bill aside and replacing his view with a pair of white and woolly testicles. 
Avram, the old Nuwabian court clerk, had joined Malachi to make a rotisserie of Lord Peckerwood, and they jostled him back and forth with great enthusiasm. My real name's Earl, and I'ma fill my hole! Shmulek, who yearned above all to be made whole, was being infused by at least ten inches of the melanin he so desired. And, as angry as I'd been with him the other night, I said a silent prayer to Nibiru that at least some of it would stick. It shouldn't matter to him anymore if he'd truly shed his tribal vestments, but I was starting to get the idea they'd misinterpreted my message a bit. Could have been something to do with the gaping hole metaphor. Ugh, I told you those metaphors are trouble. At least they stopped fighting for the moment. More compelling than the need for tribal identity is the occasional illicit sex act. It's like a paper towel tube of marmalade for the soul. And just then, when I thought the whole world had been cast into chaos, the fabric of space-time torn to ribbons, the Order of God tossed into a celestial Cuisinart, I heard an even greater message, one so profound it dwarfed the gay orgy in its perspective. The prophet was a prison guard, a knight in shining polyester. He came with cuffs on his hips and good news on his lips. He said, Roll it up, Sturdivant. You're going home. I was being released a day early. For good behavior. Hm. He didn't have to tell me twice. Just as I was making my exit, C.O. Beverly rushed in clad in nothing but his sock garters, his bruised and turgid lance poised for the joust of his life. I'm Randy Beverly, and I want to get my dick sucked. 10. Escape Three convicts were scheduled for release today, and we stood peaceably in line with our meager possessions. All I had was my paperwork and my prison pussy. Oh, and Gilbert's lighter, but that was considered contraband, so it was stashed in my suitcase. In the very next building, a revolution was taking place. I doubted it would be a lasting revolution. A revolution like this could leave its revolutionaries feeling a little awkward afterwards. To be honest, I was pretty sure only a full-blown race war could calm the dissonance short a result. So much for being honest and well-intentioned. All I'd hoped to do was enlighten the poor folks, help them find their unique paths to happiness. But how could I hope to undo at once what took so long to build? Some of these ideologies were so elaborate, it'd be like untangling the world's longest string of Christmas lights, only to find they were broken in the first place. I mean, how could you believe so strongly in something when none of its bulbs really shine any light? Why not plug in your ideology first and see how it works? Are you full of Christmas cheer? Or are you surrounded by dim bulbs? Look. I'm not trying to change your mind here. Believe what you want to believe. But, if a floating mothership of chlorophyll green negroes lands in Franklin, I'm not walking away without giving them a piece of my mind. Because their religion is silly. And if they don't let me on their spaceship, they can kiss my suitcase. The discharged people, or whatever they were called, were really taking their time today. My eyes started to wander around the room. C.O. Pendleton was posted by the gate. Beyond the gate, freedom. The first prisoner in line was still being processed. How long does it take to process a human being? What does that even mean? A five-second burst in the food processor is enough to turn tomatoes into gazpacho. How long should it take to process an incarcerated man into a non-incarcerated one? The door was right there. It had to be nearing 15, 20 minutes by now, and the first prisoner was still standing at the desk. I batted my eyelashes at Pendleton, hoping he'd give me some kind of preferential treatment, but he was as stoic as Robocop. I just couldn't take it anymore. The door to freedom was 15 feet away, and here I was, being forced to stand in line. No cuts, no butts, no coconuts. I had a best-selling book to write after that. I'd never have to stand in line again. There's only one way to describe this iniquity. It's racism, and I won't stand for it. There was a bathroom near the office, so I nonchalantly walked in. What if someone takes your place in line? I can hear you say. Well, I wouldn't worry about that. In the bathroom, I examined the drop ceiling. I stood on the toilet and unseated one of the panels. 
With my prison pussy in my waistband for safekeeping, I pulled myself up into the crawl space. Relieved to find the support beams were strong enough to support my considerably muscular physique. Quietly, I slid the displaced panel back into place. On hands and knees, I navigated through the dark and schmuncy passage toward where I thought the outside wall would be. Maybe I could find a vent or something, unseated with a heroic kick and drop to freedom. But it was too dark to see where I was going. I fished Gilbert's lighter out of my <clears throat> suitcase and struck a small and smelly flame. No vents, panels, or any clear exit. Damn. I admit, I toyed with the idea of turning back and waiting my turn in line. But doing so would make the interracial gay orgy the climax of the story. And everything that follows? Descending action. Consider my own character arc here. Obviously, I need some kind of big dramatic crisis so I can overcome my fundamental flaw and emerge victorious. You came here for me. Not the creepy white supremacists or the greasy Nuobians. They can all go fuck themselves. <laughs> and each other. I kept crawling. A little further down, I saw there was a galvanized steel drainage pipe running along the inside of the cinder block wall. Seeing this, I was galvanized into action. I made my way to the pipe and squeezed into the hollow area it ran through. The pipe ran from the foundation to at least three or four floors overhead. Somewhere high above, I could see a trace of natural light. It looked like it was shining in through the slats of a vent or some kind of register. It was worth a shot. The steel was sufficiently corroded that it gave me a non-slip grip to climb with, and, along with my scratchy pink prison tunic, I clung to the steel like a little Jewish rain frog. Inching my way up the cold pipe, I felt like a parasite in the bowels of Orange Oak's penitentiary. I tried picturing my location from the vantage point of the yard. I thought I knew where the light might be coming from. There was some kind of vent up there, I thought. I caught sight of it while I was power bombing Kevin Morton. If I could reach it, I might use a well-placed karate kick or dim mock strike to knock it loose, squeeze through the opening, and free climb down the outside wall into the yard. The thought of all that effort made me hungry, and I wished I'd gotten a chance to eat my breakfast. But my hunger for freedom eclipsed all else. There was no turning back now. Inch by inch. I made my way up the vent. I could see the entire yard through the slats. No prisoners would be on the yard this early, but I was surprised to see the guard tower empty. Then it occurred to me why. Beverly was slated for tower duty today. He was getting his dick sucked. The technique I settled on was the one-inch punch, made famous by Bruce Lee and perfected by yours truly. The corroded tin vent surrendered its grip. I reached one leg through the opening, then the other. I pushed myself through until I was resting on my chest. I looked down. Just a few feet below me, there was an outcrop I could land on. A kind of stone veranda surrounding the gates to the yard. Not far inside those gates would be Robocop himself. C.O. Pendleton. I'd have to do this as quietly as possible. Executing a perfect parkour landing and roll, I dropped onto the top with ninja-like silence. Not a peep from the building. It occurred to me that I'd stand out like a sore thumb in my pink prison garb. So I stripped down to my underwear and left my clothes on the roof. I squatted on the edge and took hold of the stone pillar and slid down to the ground. No one in sight. Ducked down low, I loped across the yard until I reached the wall near the basketball courts. Twenty feet high and topped with razor wire. I took one last look over my shoulder, then scaled the wall, slithered through the razor wire, and dropped down on the other side. Freedom. Author's note. Before you accuse me of blowing past that part, let me remind you how forthcoming I've been to this point. Certainly you can survive without a few minor details. This much I will tell you, though. My re-entry into the free world was not unlike my initial one. I was cold. I was hungry. And I was now completely naked. Looking up, I saw my underwear dangling on a barb of razor wire. It was now me versus the world, with nothing in between. Checking often for the inevitable helicopter, I bounded over the billowing hills of the landfill. I stopped behind a construction trailer to catch my breath. 
peek through the window to see if anyone was inside. Nobody there. But neither were their clothes. More food. God, I was hungry. I listened quietly for a minute, but there were no surging search teams, no whirring helicopter blades. Could it be that I'd made a clean escape? Vanished into thin air? On I went, a nude and swastika-covered coyote, prowling through the high grass of the Blue Hill Preserve. By the time I reached the foot of the mountain, I figured by the sun it was about 3 p.m. Nature unmolested and magnificent, from horizon to horizon. It would have looked gorgeous if I wasn't so hungry. I was nearly shaking with hunger at this point, and every bit of greenery looked fit for a salad. But with no dressing or bacon bits on hand, this was out of the question. Anyway, you sliced it. My next meal was on the other side of this mountain. I started walking. I found a tattered hiking trail a few hundred yards in, but quickly lost it again. I wished I had kept my shoes on, but I had left them by the wall. The idea of being naked with my shoes on offended my sense of symmetry. There was nothing I could do but keep walking. So, I walked. And walked. I came into a clearing near the summit of the mountain. My bare feet welcomed the mossy, loamy forest floor. The sun in the sky said 7 p.m., and I was running out of daylight fast. To make matters worse, I was beyond hungry. I was pretty sure I was starving. Where that line officially was, I didn't know but I was fairly certain I had crossed it. I sat near an old campfire pit that looked like it hadn't been used in years. The sun was quickly retreating now and a chill had entered the air. With the last of my waning strength, I shoveled handfuls of leaves and old dead twigs into the pit, fished Gilbert's lighter out of my <clears throat> suitcase, and got a pitiful little fire started. With time it grew, and I added bigger bits of wood and forest detritus until the fire was enough to warm by. The circulation returned to my fingers and toes, but the knot in my stomach only tightened. It was full dark now, maybe 10 p.m. I'd missed three square meals. Soon, I'd miss my midnight snack. I was starving. Starving to death in the wilderness. It was just then that I heard a voice. A small voice but clearly directed toward me. Rise, Jeff. Kill and eat. What? From out of the brush, a little bunny hopped into my camp. A white, fluffy bunny. Rise, Jeff. Kill and eat. Now I was sure I had heard the thing right. Either that or I was hallucinating. Was I seeing a vision? Didn't this happen in the Bible? Kill and eat, it repeated. Kill and eat. Kill and eat. It was definitely talking. I could see its little mouth moving now. This was unusual, I thought. You mean... you? I asked. Kill and eat... you. Kill and eat! Kill and eat! Fearlessly, the bunny hopped into my lap. It looked up at me with its big, black bunny eyes. What's your name? I asked. Kill and eat! Is that all you goddamn say? Kill and eat! Kill and eat! Well, you don't have to ask me twice, I said. I grabbed the bunny by the scruff of the neck with my left hand. It blinked its big bunny eyes at me and folded its ears back. I punched the bunny in the face a few dozen times until my arm was too tired to continue. Its face looked much different afterwards, but it was far from dead. Kill and eat, it said, but now its voice sounded like it had been punched in the face a few dozen times. Kill and eat. I poked it viciously in the eyes, a la the Three Stooges. I thought maybe I could get to the brain if I poked hard enough, but this didn't seem to be working either. Then it occurred to me. This was definitely not the best way to kill a bunny. I was never a Boy Scout, keep in mind. This whole survivalist thing was new to me. But the best way to kill a bunny was probably the same way you'd kill a kitten, or a Bichon Frise or a baby mink. You twist its head until the neck snaps. Kill and eat, it said one last time. I twisted its head until I heard that satisfying snap, not unlike the cap on a refreshing carbonated beverage. There, I said. Step one, done. I just sat there for a minute and looked at the mangled bunny in my lap. 
I sifted around the stones by the campfire until I found one that looked sharp enough. Then I laid the bunny on its back and attempted to skin it. It was harder than you'd think. The skin was so soft and pliable it was impossible to pierce. In the end, the act felt barbaric, and I settled on tying its ears in a knot and holding it over the fire with a branch. The acrid fumes of burning fur filled the camp. Soon after, the aroma of meat. When the bunny was what I estimated well done, a charred and blackened anthropoid on a stick, I took it from the fire and blew on it. I nibbled on one of its feet a little bit, but it tasted awful. I threw the carcass on the ground and sat sulking with my knees to my chest. I hadn't had a proper meal in six days now. Not a crowned rack of lamb, no filet tartare, not a solitary egg of beluga. Nothing. There was a good chance I'd already become malnourished beyond repair. And where was this god who provideth? Who provideth me without so much as a young asparagus and a George Foreman grill? Why, God? Why do you withhold it? Why do you leave me without it? I tried slitting my wrist with the rock I tried on the rabbit, but it only kind of scratched me. I suppose it wasn't the most genuine effort, only a kind of symbolic gesture to demonstrate I was unhappy with my accommodations. In that vein, I commenced to flagellate myself with a green twig from a nearby sapling. When my arm got tired, I tossed the twig away and just sat there with my arms wrapped around my knees. I lay my head on the hard forest floor and pictured Mike Lindell sleeping soundly on his pillow in Minnesota and was filled with sour resentment. With his machine washable cover and patented fill, what did God see in him that he didn't see in me? Could it be that God himself watched out for the Canada goose? Could Mike Lindell have found favor with him simply for discovering an alternative to Goose Down? Could the very streets of heaven be swarming with Canada geese, the gold-paved streets made green with grassy goose shit? My god. The thought made so much sense it sent a wave of dread through me. It was I who was the problem. I who was wrong. I looked up to the indifferent heavens watched the listless stars in their perpetual retreat. I felt the great, vacuous nothing of the universe, saw my sorry silhouette against the night sky. This inconsequential bug on the circle of the earth. Jeff Sturdivant, a man made wrong, down to the very spelling of his name. The cosmos wanted no part of me, even gigaparsecs away, the stars denied me their light. I felt a great sucking loneliness that threatened to sweep the whole world from beneath my fallen body, to roll up everything I've touched and throw it in the wash, to send me careening into this vast and empty nothing. It takes bravery. It takes courage to stand alone in this dark and sucking nothing. To be an emaciated raisin in the mealy slop of the earth? But will you weep when I'm gone? Will you even notice? Will you? Will you even remember me? I lay on my side and clutched my prison pussy to my chest. We did not make love. We just held each other. There would be no one to watch me die. No hand to hold but the icy grip of death. In the dark, unforgiving wilderness where already the vermin of the earth could sense my slowing heart, making ready to reclaim what was there since the beginning. My dying, useless flesh. The last look at the star saw them winking out of existence. I knew just why. They were turning away, no less dispassionate than people. One turns his back to you, then another, then another. Then you're an outcast, a weirdo, a nothing. And the moon was high in the sky that night, but there was no man on its face to appeal to. Just the pocked and cratered buttocks of its ancient wizened ass. I was the most alone man on the planet, 
pending the discovery of extraterrestrial life, I was the most alone man in the universe. And alone, I would die. And I would not go to heaven, not like Mike Lindell. Nor would I go to hell, because God would be too indifferent to send me to either one. I was dying, and when I did, I'd be gone, and that will be that, tossed into God's Cuisinart and expressed in celestial gazpacho. Oy vey, I said, vey is mir. 11. Rebirth I felt better in the morning. Weak, but not so existentially dreadful. Sorry about all that. The fire dwindled to a few glowing embers. The birds high above in the canopy engaged in their chipper coffee talk. I was still starving to death, but the end hadn't been so near as I thought. Maybe I'd give the bunny another try. I'd heard it was an acquired taste. But when I turned to look, I saw the rabbit was gone. And then I saw the paw prints around me circling the camp. The prints were unmistakable. They were wolves. There must have been a whole pack of them. How hadn't they eaten me too? They hadn't even disturbed my slumber. I didn't appreciate them stealing my bunny, but this had to have been the most polite encounter with wolves one could hope for. And if not a pack of wolves, at least a band of coyotes. Possibly a skulk of foxes. At the very least, a boogle of weasels or a business of ferrets. Still, it was hard to imagine how I hadn't been killed. A naked and tasty morsel, weak and defenseless in the middle of the wilderness. And that's when I saw the other footprints. They brought immediately to mind the epic poem, Footprints in the Sand, wherein Jesus carries the protagonist through the most troublesome times of his life. I saw the footprints with my own two eyes, leading up the path and into the camp, the exact same way I'd come, leading straight to where I sat this very moment. And I knew then, God did provideth, and that I was never truly alone. He'd come in the night and cast away a pack of wolves to protect his precious child. Why would he have done that if he meant to let me die? He didn't. I had my destiny to fulfill. I had a manuscript in my <clears throat> suitcase, destined to become a New York Times bestseller. I had Jason Hill to track down, the so-called King Shit of Fuck Mountain, with his harem of women and hemoglobin-laced voice. And God help him if he welched on our deal. My next hiking trip would be up to his mountaintop chalet. I would fulfill my destiny even if it meant returning to prison with paperwork that needed no forgery. Renewed, I got to my feet and continued on. It was all downhill from here. 12. Return I'd become a creature of the forest after my night in the wilderness, and only halfway down the mountain did I realize I was unpresentable in my current condition for my return to polite society. I stopped to rest in a weedy copse of birches and fashioned a crude pair of underwear from the broad leaves of the bastard Helleborin. I thought I'd looked rather fetching in them. My hypoglycemic delirium had given way to a ketogenic weakness. It was clear my body had begun to consume itself. I was crawling on all fours by the time I reached the foot of the mountain. Franklin Park. One mile, a street sign said. This struck me as so profoundly poetic. I lay prostrate in the roadside gravel and let the gravitas wash over me. Then I got back to my hands and knees and continued on. I was less crawling, more slithering by the time I emerged onto my street. If viewed from high above, you would have seen a meandering swastika tracing a line across the countryside, a visual depiction of Hitler's occupation of France in World War II. And, if you had, you might have described it in fewer words, or even decided it was a bit of a reach for a lousy metaphor, and done away with it altogether. I've been through a lot, Raider. Stop busting my stones. Crawling up the front lawn, my house looked so much bigger than it ever had. I never imagined I dwelled in such a stately manner. My plush and luxurious bed. My refrigerator, filled with refreshing beverages and treats fit for royalty. 
And there was my car. My trusty old Toyota. I hadn't realized how much I missed driving. How much I missed delivering parcels. Even the strange stuff like dildos, bareheads, and biohazardous who knew what. I missed it all. Never had I been so grateful to finally be home. At the front door now, I pulled myself up to my feet, braced myself against the door frame. I reached for my pocket to get my keys. Oh, fiddlesticks, I said. It's difficult to explain how one feels in a situation like this, so I'm just going to stick to the action. I crawled back down the driveway, across my neighborhood, up the interstate, into the woods, back to the copse of birches and bastard Helberin, up the mountain, through the camp, over Jesus' footprints, back down the mountain, through the high grass of the nature preserve, past the construction trailer, over the hill and dale, through the smelly landfill, up the prison wall, through the razor wire where I retrieved my underpants, down the wall into the yard, through the yard, where high above, C.O. Beverly was busy masturbating, up the stone pillar to the roof, where I put back on my prison garb, pulled myself back into the vent, crawled back down the pipe, made my way to the filthy crawl space, moved the ceiling tile, and dropped back into the bathroom. I checked myself in the mirror, splashed a little water on my face. I walked back out into the discharge area, or whatever it was called. The line had long since disappeared. I approached the window. I'm Jeff Sturdivant, I said. The lady raised an eyebrow. She thumbed through a nearby stack of papers, hid a few keys in her computer. She had medium-high cheekbones. Weren't you supposed to be released yesterday? She asked. I, um, I was in the bathroom, I said. Thirteen. Afterward. You know, with all our perceived differences, it seems to me that there are two real types of people in this world. Those who go, ba 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 during Sweet Caroline, and we who watch them with pity and disgust and a secret longing in our hearts to be just a little bit more like them. If you're looking for the thesis of this book, I'm not sure that was it. It was just something I thought of this morning that kind of amused me. I guess since this is a highly academic book, I should make some kind of point here that ties everything together, that justifies everything I've written as being integral to the book's central message. How's this? The world is full of characters, and each of us has his or her own set of attribute points. We're wizards, warriors, orcs, bards, nuwabians, warlocks, whatever. We each have our strengths, each have our weaknesses, each have our special abilities, areas of expertise if you like that better, and each have our crosses to bear. You may find it depressing that we're living in a giant computer simulation, but there's also something beautiful about life in a video game. As long as we don't mind grinding for experience points, we can all level up. Praise the sun and fear the old blood. Granted, you may never get to my level, but understand that the delivery guy is a highly chic position reserved for those of a royal bloodline. Alternatively, you may choose to be an NPC. For all you gigazoids who don't know what this means, I suggest you shoo away your sexy girlfriends and go look it up. A non-player character is just what it sounds like. Not a genuine character, but a computer-programmed, grass-nibbling, platitude-honking goose. God doesn't provide it for non-player characters, and for those of you who don't believe in God, let me ask you one simple question. If there is no God, then why does my car go faster after I wash it? Something to meditate on. Anyway... That's all I was trying to explain to the prisoners before the amalgamation of abomination took place. My favorite thing about the people I see every day is that they're all a bunch of characters. They are their own characters. All unique. And I treasure all their quirks and eccentricities. They make my life in a simulated video game that much more interesting. And the man upstairs? The one with the wireless controller and the bag of Doritos in his lap? I think he likes them too. Aside... Yes, I realize Amalgamation of Abomination is also a pretty good band name. But you can't use this one, as I've compiled the world's first Kvetch core band of the same name. Voracious Vaginas is still up for grabs, though. Anyway, 
I'm home, and my life has returned to normal. And it seems kind of silly to have swastikas and SS bolts tattooed all over my body, especially after publicly condemning identity politics. It made sense at the time, I guess. Temporary tattoos would be a much better idea, especially for shorter sentences. I thought I'd start a little side business for myself. Temporary Nazi tattoos for short prison sentences. I could call the governor and propose legislation that would make these tattoos available in commissary statewide. I considered the idea very seriously for a minute or two, then completely lost interest. I'll have the tattoos removed, eventually. All but maybe one. I'll leave the P from the white pride tattoo on my stomach. It's roughly in the center of my torso, so it won't offend my sense of symmetry. The P will remind me of my time in prison and the delightful people I met there. The Nawabians, who taught me how to dream. The white supremacists, who taught me pride is only skin deep. And the Mexicans, who I didn't really interact with, but I do like their food. And most of all, Kevin Morton, who taught me that anyone can be redeemed. And if not to society at large, at least to himself. Who needs society anyway? Stop. I already know what you want to ask me. Would you do it all again, Jeff? If you could turn back time, rewind to that fateful afternoon last Friday, would you approach the situation any differently? Maybe. Maybe I'd fuck that goose right in the ass. Or the egg hole, whatever. I guess the male goose only has an ass, so yeah, probably the ass. Then, I'd yank the mother goose off her nest and fuck her too. Then I'd fuck all the eggs. Because a prison taught me one thing. It's this. Justice is rarely about making things even. Consider. A judge, dressed in the colors of a Canada goose, sends me, of all people, the most proper and dignified person imaginable, to serve hard time for defending myself on behalf of a bird you can still find frozen in specialty supermarkets. Roll that one around in your noggin for a bit. There's no question that the scales of justice were tilted against me. How I managed to retain my good nature is a mystery to us all. I'll be back at Building 14 soon enough. I'm sure Mr. Big Shot will still be strutting his stuff. All proud and self-righteous now that justice was done. But justice is a sanctified synonym for revenge. And the more moralizing one does on behalf of it, the more kind, decent, and imperfect people like you and me end up at each other's throats. If I had tried to bite the bailiff on the nuts... And believe me, the thought did cross my mind. I'd have expected nothing less than a good gavel to the forehead. That, I'd have no trouble calling justice. I did not think of the sort, however. In fact, I'm just about the kindest, nicest, most altruistic person I know. I mentioned I was imperfect a few sentences back, but I'm not even sure that holds water. I'm modest, too, which makes me that much more wonderful. That said... I was only kidding about raping Mr. Big Shot. I don't blame you if you missed the joke there. I know you're not accustomed to being irreverent or facetious after such a serious story, but I assure you, revenge is beneath me now. I'd never stoop to the level of these bloodthirsty justice seekers. Life is too wonderful to waste your time wallowing in resentment. Besides, I couldn't even picture doing such a terrible thing. I do know someone who could, though, which is why I've got a box about the size of a goose, a prepaid shipping label, and a really good roll of packing tape. Seriously, Jeff, you accuse me. After all you've been through, after everything you just said. All right, all right, settle down. I told you I never lie, but I never claim to be consistent.
tales for dark nights.